Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar on behalf of Chelsea Green Publishing and Beaver Trust uh, to the event which is called Bringing Back the Beaver, Damned If We Do, Damned If We Don't, no pun intended at all. Uh, Chelsea Green is an indie publishing house that's employee owned uh, both in the US and UK and Beaver Trust is a new charity in Britain aiming to restore Britain's rivers and bring beavers back into our landscape. My name is Sophie Pavel and I lead communications for Beaver Trust and I'm thrilled to be introducing tonight's event. Now obviously under normal circumstances we would be meeting in person and maybe having a little bit of a party but sadly due to the pandemic obviously we've taken it all online but this does not mean that juicy stimulating conversation is precluded and I have no doubt that we're going to have an excellent uh, discussion tonight. Um, so it's a special day today because Derek Gow has published a book called Bringing Back the Beaver and it's published today. Um, I do have a copy of my own but I've actually lent it to a friend and that I guess just shows how much I enjoyed it. It's an incredibly entertaining and inspiring account of the pivotal role that Derek has played in the journey of bringing the beavers back to British landscapes and the ups and downs and all the challenges along the way. Now alongside many laughs the message is very clear that the obstacles that are involved in bringing a mammal like the beaver back to British landscapes that has been gone from for so many years and restoring our rivers, um, many of these obstacles have been invented by us. And that means that a better relationship with the natural world is definitely achievable if we think about things in the right way. The book is really passionately written and it couldn't be more topical because as I'm sure you've seen, beavers have had quite the summer in terms of having quite a media storm and a lot of chatter around them in the conservation world. So you can buy the book anywhere. Um, I would recommend that you would go to your local bookseller and support them during this time. Um, it's really important that we do that. But yeah, you can buy uh, Bringing Back the Beaver anywhere that sells books and you can't miss it because it's got a giant beaver on the front. So <laughs> definitely look out for that one. Um, if you want to share the fact that you're participating in tonight's event and you want to shout about it, please tag us on social media. You can find Chelsea Green at Chelsea Green on Twitter. Uh, same with Beaver Trust at Beaver Trust across social media. Um, you can use hashtags like Beaver Believer or Bringing Back the Beaver and maybe we might get a trend going. Who knows? Beavers are pretty cool. Uh, so you can participate in this event uh, live. So make sure that you put any questions that you want to ask that you want to ask the panelists um, in the Q and A box at the bottom, and we'll make sure that we have time to fit those ones in. Um, so moving on tonight, we are very spoiled by having a brilliant chair lead the discussion. I'm really honoured to introduce this incredible woman. It's Gillian Burke. A lot of you may recognise her from TV, uh, but if you don't know that much about her, um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background. So following a degree in biology from the University of Bristol, Gillian pursued a career in natural history filmmaking. Uh, she started her job as a researcher and worked her way up the ranks to eventually become a producer and director working on series for channels like Animal Planet and Discovery. Closer to home, Gillian joined the watches, so Spring Watch, Autumn Watch and Winter Watch in 2018 alongside Chris Packham, Michaela Strachan and Yolo Williams and has since become a cornerstone of the series. And she was recently chatting beavers on the daily this spring down at the Cornwall Beaver Project during Spring Watch whilst we were all in lockdown. And um, certainly for me, that was a daily tonic that I looked forward to <laughs> most of the day. So outside of TV, Gillian is really passionate about her conservation charity work. She is a patron of the Cornwall Seal Research Group Trust and volunteers for the Marine Strandings Network. She's an active and incredibly inspiring campaigner, both on and offline, about everything to do with climate change, biodiversity loss and diversity in conservation. And she's just an all round legend and I'm thrilled that she's chairing this discussion this evening. So without further ado, Gillian, over to you. Wow, I'll do my best not to chuckle through that. Thanks so much, Sophie, for such a lovely introduction. Um, but you know, I'm gonna just jump straight in because this is all about the beaver, let's face it. Um, my first encounter with um, Eurasian beavers was at the Cornwall Beaver Project, which is not far from where I live in Cornwall. And um, I was sent over there to film for Autumn Watch a few years back. 
it was dark, um, it was cold, it was wet, and I didn't see any beavers, but I did hear one. And it was this almighty tail slap, um, just meters away from one of the original pair that were released into uh, the enclosure at Woodland Valley Farm. And I was actually really embarrassed about my reaction because like my jaw dropped. I, I didn't realize I could do that. And, you know, eyes popped. It was, it was a rush. And I was not expecting that. And I think it's because there was something, even back then, when the beavers had only been there for a few months and really had only just gotten to work with transforming that space in the way that only beavers can. Um, even back then, it felt like a really wild space. Um, and since that time and the few years that they've been there, I've seen that tiny area um, transform into something that's a little bit reminiscent, this tiny little pocket of wilderness that reminds me of like the scrub and the water holes of like, you know, the childhood um, I spent in Kenya and East Africa. So it was such a thrill to be able to present this year's Spring Watch from that site. And I know that loads of you here today watching, and thanks so much, for, for joining us. Um, you'll be really familiar with these animals, their biology, the impact that they can have on habitats, on the wider wild landscape. And, but for people outside of the beaver bubble, um, it's a, it, you know, when I was doing spring watch, it was a case of going back to beaver basics. Um, you know, like looking at this sort of head to toe anatomy, <laughs> tail anatomy, if you like, you know, so they literally had me sort of staring at I think I called it the business end of the beaver at one point, but it was, it was generally, it was a real pleasure to be able to hear the feedback from the audience and, um, and to really kind of see our audience, the Spring Watch audience fall in love with these animals as much as, as much as I have. And I think it's safe to say though, um, I was really late to the party. Um, the story of beaver reintroductions into Britain began almost 20 years ago and um, you know, largely with one man and his story. I'm going to do this for you, Derek, is all in this book. Um, and we're going to be hearing all about that later about um, from Derek, who's the author of Bringing Back the Beaver. Um, today is a publication day for the book. And it's an amazing story. And we're going to hear from the other panelists as well. Um, I think my favorite part of the story of bringing beavers back to Britain, um, this is a species that was hunted to extinction almost four centuries ago. And after all that time, the question I find most intriguing is, is it possible that these animals are really well suited to dealing with some really 21st century environmental challenges that we're facing at the moment? Now, the River, um, river Otter Beaver Trial, and believe me, that's a bit of a mouthful on live TV, but the River Otter Beaver Trial has reached its conclusion. And the decision from DEFRA um, earlier this year to allow them to stay was, was met it was seen as like a huge triumph and it was a milestone decision. So, um, you know, it's, it was much needed light in a year that is challenging everyone um, to have that decision from DEFRA, but the road has not been straightforward. And I think that's a bit of an understatement, which I'm sure um, our panelists can go into a bit more. Um, but, you know, there has been controversy and disagreement, but crucially, there has been collaboration as well. And people have found a way to work together, even if they don't always agree. Um, so there's a lot has been achieved. There's still a long way to go and certainly a long way in establishing the future of this species in Britain. And to help us make sense of it all, the story so far and the road ahead, I'd like to introduce the panel and to get the conversation going. So first up, um, I'd like to introduce Lucy Hodson. Um, it's always a little bit of a surprise when I introduce Lucy because I'm an avid follower of Lucy's blogs and her social media content. And uh, she's a first rate naturalist and science communicator, but her social media handle is actually Lucy Lapwing. And for ages, I thought it was such a happy coincidence that her surname was so well suited to her content, but no, it's Lucy Hodson, um, who's a conservationist, a naturalist and self-described nature nerd, and is passionate about connecting wider audiences to our natural world. Um, I've also got Anne Maidment, who is, um, Director of CLA Southwest, that's Country Land and Business Association. Um, she's keenly involved with Family Farm in North Wiltshire, but also a qualified rural surveyor, 
um, with an estate management background and that goes alongside her farming experience and, and like I said earlier is director of the CLA Southwest which covers Cornwall, Devon, Dorset, Gloucestershire, Somerset, Wiltshire so a lot of work I imagine Anne. <laughs> and then last but not least Derek Gow I've, um, we've not met, I've not met Derek, but I feel like I have. Um, I've heard a lot about Derek over the years. His name has come up um, time and time again. And for those of you who don't know Derek, I know there'll be plenty of you who do, but Derek is a farmer and a nature conservationist and author of the book that, um, I just plugged, Bring About the Beaver, uh, born in Dundee in 1965. I don't know if you wanted me to say that, Derek, but there you go. Um, he's managed several wildlife parks in Europe, in Scotland, and nature centres in England. Um, now lives in on the Devon Cornwall border on a 300-acre farm, which he's in the process <laughs> of building. Is that right? <laughs> you laugh. Yeah, I'm like, laughing at Paul Cottington for the night of the NFU's comment, so <laughs> I'll get him later in the pub, don't you worry. <laughs> so Derek has played a significant role in the reintroduction of the Eurasian beaver, the water vole, and the white stork in England, and um, has other projects underway as well. But I um, might let Derek tell you all about that. So I'm just gonna start with a nice little opener of a question. Um, beavers are regularly described as ecosystem engineers. And I just wanted to hear from each of you, maybe starting with Lucy, um, what you think that the most impressive fee, obviously that means whatever you say, Lucy, means that Derek and Anne can't answer, so <laughs> choose wisely. Um, but yeah, what is their most impressive thing that beavers do, in your view? Oh, most impressive thing that beavers do. Um, I mean, there's lots, aren't there? They're just, they're fascinating, charismatic, weird, beautiful and ugly animals at the same time. Um, and I think that's probably for me the most amazing thing about well about any way that any ecosystem functions is how just one individual species and just the way it lives can influence in a knock-on effect so many um, and the thing that really gets me excited about beavers is strangely enough probably dead wood um, so quite a lot of my kind of conservation career so far I've worked on a, a number of ancient woodland nature reserves and getting to know the wildlife that is so intricately associated with the wood of trees that's hundreds of years old and it needs that um that dead rotting wood so saprozilic one of my favorite nature nerd terms invertebrates that live exclusively in dead wood and so i've worked before in sherwood forest and the species of spiders there that are found nowhere else in the uk and that species of spider will only live in an abandoned bird's nest in an oak tree that's over 400 years old it's like how niche can you get and the way that beavers, I think, operate in an ecosystem, they're creating that dead wood that we, we see less and less now. We, you know, we have such a tendency as a species ourselves to over-tidy, particularly in the UK. Uh, nature tidiness is a really weird affliction we have. And uh, the fact that we get rid of a lot of fallen deadwood trees, the fact that we pick up any logs that are lying around, uh, we might nick it for firewood. There's not a lot of that deadwood habitat around. So the fact that beavers are doing it for us, I think is just brilliant. <laughs> That's lovely. And you're right. Absolutely. That's, um, you know, a, a habitat that is fast dis disappearing. And what about you? I mean, you, you're coming at this from a very different perspective from Lucy. What is, is there something that impresses you about beavers? Yeah, I think, um, thanks, Gillian. I should probably sort of say as part of my role with the CLA in the Southwest, I've been involved with the River Otter Beaver Trial on the steering group from the start. So um, I've been fortunate enough to hear regular reports from Devon Wildlife Trust, the University of Exeter, um, when we've met um, more and more frequently as we came towards the end of the trial. And what fascinated me was seeing the effectiveness that beavers had on managing water and whether that's uh, the, the quality or the flow. And there was a particular report I remember we were given by Mark Elliott, which showed in the uh, West Devon enclosed trial that they had, um, the improvement in the water quality in that particular stream um, and how it had changed so uh, rapidly. So I can't say that that would be effective everywhere but it was just fascinating to see in that particular monitored project the effect effectiveness that they had had um, and what I would probably add and it's not directly an impressive feat of engineering and I'm sure the beaver is completely unaware of this 
but it's just an observation into the extraordinary interest that these animals seem to bring. And um, whether that's from uh, an ecologist point of view and the amount of people that are, are watching this this evening, but also through the significant rise that we've seen in ecotourism in Devon since the trial began. Um, so that, that would be my answer. Hmm. So Deadwood, Water, Derek, <laughs> um, you've spent an awful lot of time, you know, probably, well, I was going to say more intimate, but maybe that's not the best word choice at this stage, but you've spent a lot of time with beavers. And I just, you know, what is, is there one thing, is it easy to even like pick one feature that impresses you about them? It's simple. They are the generators of life. Wetlands are the richest living environment that is on the planet. And without the beaver, they desiccate. Beavers are nature's water gardeners. They create living space for every guild of thing we consider, from frogs to toads, from, from red-backed shrikes, which we know are wetland birds, to, to, the, to the great giants of the Eurasian animal world, like moose coming down to feed in the reed beds that surround their, 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 their otherwise woody lagoons. So for me, beavers are, are, we don't understand them as well as we think. We've written a lot about them, but they can still produce surprises, but particularly in some of the things they do. You know, so for example, in my book, I describe you know, recent footage of a female beaver um, burying its dead kit very carefully. And, and this behavior has been seen elsewhere and remarked upon. And this remarkable animal, which is not a keystone species, as the North Americans tell us, it's, it's a natural force of nature has always fascinated people from the earliest of times. So for me, you know, beginning to understand the beaver and come to, to terms with it, and yes, spend a lot of time with them in the years I've worked with them has been the most remarkable life journey. So Derek, I mean, that's probably led me nicely into the next question because um, there was a, a term in your book that you used, the beaver generated landscape. And it really struck me. I mean, it has, you know, time and time again, this idea that what we are looking at now is likely to be a desperately impoverished landscape compared to what was before. And you paint um, a, a really beautiful picture, actually, in the book of what that scene would have been like. You talk about sort of sand lizards perched on the beaver dams and sort of like almost like, you know, well, our guide books don't say that's the natural habitat. But can you just maybe paint that scene of like what this beaver generated landscape would look like for, for our listeners, our audience. Well, if we're trying to get our heads around what a beaver generated landscape of the past would be, then that would have been, then we, we would have to go to, to perhaps Eastern Europe or the few parts of North America where they've never been utterly destroyed today. So you would have been looking at, you know, wetlands that were millions of hectares in extent. There would have been, there would not have been river valleys because the rivers would have been plains of water moving over the land. You know, streams tinkling through, you know, st giant stands of, 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 of greater tussock sedge that might have, have been alive for a hundred years that would have been, you know, eight, nine feet in height. Uh, there would have been game trails made by the big animals you know, like moose and, and wild cattle. Predators like wolf and lynx and bear would have come down to hunt in the areas that just teemed with small mammals and game killing opportunities. Uh, there would have been huge rookeries of birds like pelicans and storks, wetlands teeming with fish and, and the trees that the beaver felled and, you know, to create this tangled, sub, um, you know, sunken jung um, jungle. Fish would have swum through, the, um, through the, the, the tree heads and flocks like birds. There would have been giant fish like, um, like burbot lurking in the dark and great pike. You know, if the sea connected as it so readily did to, um, to, to, to estuaries and to saline waters, then on occasion porpoise and seals would have come up to hunt in these environments as well. And we know that at least in part this was true because of the archaeology um, of the fens that tells us it was so. But of course, that archaeology is only partial. Those were the big animals and, and the big things that we could focus on. There would have been very many others and more recent um, um, studies of, of the Fenland silts suggest that at one point in time, these great sweet steaming swamps harbored many, many amphibians that are now gone. So there have been frog choruses, the likes of which, you know, perhaps you'd only hear now in southern Europe, tree frogs, pool frogs. Um, moor frogs, agile frogs, escalopian snakes, um, pond tortoises basking on logs. 
So that really is the world we lost. I mean, we started it in the Bronze Age, and what we've seen over the course of the last 70 years since the Second World War is, is the impact of drainage on a scale, the likes of which the islands never experienced, to, to the point where the land is so dry and the drains are so deep that the, the, the floods we see now as being a reg regular catastrophic effect um, you know, come because there are no wetlands anymore, no sponges, nothing to delay the water um, from its falling on the highlands um, to hitting the villages and schools beneath. So, you know, the beaver's world is a, a world away from where we are now. But if we're going to do anything meaningful in this life that we have left to restore a natural process to this island, which takes land back, which recreates nature, even on a much smaller scale, then we must, we absolutely must restore the beaver. So that is, gosh, you know, you filled in so many gaps with that picture, you know, um, such a detailed um, image that you've sort of painted just with that description of this beaver generated landscape. Um, you know, for someone like me, that that's an incredibly exciting scene. Um, you know, it, it, it's sort of the idea that that could exist again. Um, it then just makes me flip into that, but how, how do you meld this with this 21st century landscape that's dominated by what people need? Um, you know, that, that, there is that tendency to pit the needs of nature against the needs of people. And um, I don't know whether Anne or Lucy, either of you wanna jump in with that, you know, how do you, how can we balance those needs? Are they really at, at odds with each other? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, as you say, Derek paints quite a picture there, um, but it's a landscape that we don't know and we won't necessarily be able to go back to in the same way. Again, we're 400 years on. We live in a modern time with modern demands and human needs. And to assume that the beaver could be resident widely across the landscape just isn't going to fit it's not going to work in all landscapes um there's talk of whether um you know beavers are sort of manipulators of the landscape i've read that language before and actually they are it, uh, there's a beaver generated landscape but there's also appropriate landscapes in order to introduce the beaver too and i think we've got to be careful in in the language that we use there and we, we don't know what a beaver generated landscape will look like and what it really did look like 400 years ago. We don't even know, you know, how humans lived 400 years ago. So I don't know how we can exactly decide what the landscape will look like. Um, so I think it's challenging and I think we have to be careful that we don't create this language of nostalgia where people think that it's just a very simple case of being able to go back to something like that. Mm. So there's some really pragmatic benefits that um, beavers, you know, have been sort of credited with in terms of, you know, just um, certainly in terms of biodiversity gains, uh, for want of a better word, um, you know, there, there's so much to suggest that they can do. But um, there are some other you know, benefits, I guess, pragmatically, you know, certainly what I saw at Cornwall Beaver Project, um, the benefits to flood management, drought management as well. So is there, is there a sort of a middle ground where, you know, what we're looking at is um, what's to be gained um, versus, you know, where, what parts of the country, is this a really good potential tool for tackling some huge environmental challenges? Can I, can I just answer Eric, that? Yeah. Because you know, I think one of the really interesting things is we sit down here tonight to discuss this book. And I've just been laughing at these comments from Paul Cottington, who's out there in the audience somewhere from the National Farmers Union, is that, you know, actually, when you reflect, we're by and large sitting down as friends. There are a few rabid old fools out there who are prepared to fight to the bitter end for, for a cause of ignorance that is all but lost. But this is a rational discussion now. And Anne's quite right. That vision I've just, read, uh, I've just presented to you, well, we don't understand it entirely, but it's a vision of the past. The challenge for us all here now 
is how we move forward. We know we're living in a time where we're facing global extinctions, the likes of which the planet has never experienced before, unless it's been hit by an asteroid. And in this case, the asteroid is us. We are the asteroid of destruction. And what we've got to do, if we're, we're going to, to look to have any future um, with life on this planet, is we've got to, to revise how we are living and realize that its resources are finite. And when you come to a British situation, well, you know, I can say what I like. I can paint what pictures I like because I'm not employed by the CLA. But Anne will recognize as well that, you know, we are working now with some of the best estates there are in Britain. You know, people whose, whose, whose culture of land use and, and whose cartilage goes back to the time of the Normans who employ some fine brains and have a great vision of what this future landscape can be. So what we're not looking at here is, 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 and who could be the best of allies because they're imaginative, determined, committed people. And what we're not looking at here is a landscape of the past. What we're looking at is how we reshape the landscape of the future. Because again, to be quite frank, I farm here. And, and when I was farming hard and we were running one and a half thousand Jews and 400 cattle, our farming operation was entirely dependent on subsidies. If we didn't have those subsidies, we couldn't have stood up as a business operation for, for, for a single calendar year. And every year all that happened was we failed in the same way we failed before. We've got to look at how we change this, this, the landscapes of this island. And in large part, much of what we use for farming is not usable. And also much of what we use for farming is now exhausted. So when you look at estates like, you know, Ken Hill, you know, where they're, they, they, they're pursuing the most incredibly imaginative project re-wetting huge areas of formerly you know fairly insipid grazing marsh and returning those to wetlands that are vast there is great hope and great promise for the future um, you know if we look at how we, we collaboratively move on together but that process can't be slow that process has to be something that becomes increasingly confident and increasingly swift we're running out of time very, very fast. And if we want to recover nature, and it may be that so many things that we think of com as being common now are so rare in reality that they're probably not going to recover without a hand, and we have to do it swiftly. So it's a case of looking at how we reshape the, the, the tapestry of this island that we've created over a very short period of time since the, the Second World War, and perhaps using you know, sums of, 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 of taxpayers' money, which are still significant, create a better living landscape for people and a better living landscape for nature. It's perfectly possible the beaver can help us with that. So, Lucy, thanks, Derek. Lucy, um, Derek's mentioned a lot there, um, but one of the things that I think um, maybe you and I, Lucy, share in common is um, how communicating this sense of urgency that we feel um, in, in the challenges that face the environment, you know, in the terms of climate and extinction and habitat loss and, and, and. Um, you know, how, how do we extend out of the beaver bubble, as I call it? You know, inside this space, there will be a lot of people who have spent a lot of time thinking about talking about, reading about, writing about, blogging about, you know, this species and all it can do, um, or all that we, you know, people don't want it to do. I, you know, th there's definitely um, several ways of looking at this, but how do we reach outside of this bubble? How do we communicate this urgency? Um, and what role does this species have in helping us to do that? That is a really good question. Um, and saying that as myself, obviously somebody who's firmly within the beaver bubble. I uh, I do have beavers on the mind a lot of the time. Um, but to your average person and my peers and friends and um, you know people that you talk to on the street, a beaver doesn't mean a lot aside from a very funny innuendo and perhaps a cartoon character conjured to mind. It's not got any implications with an animal that they're familiar with as having in the UK, um, even though we do now. It's not something that they'll have likely ever encountered anyway. It's not something you go to the zoo to see. It's not it's not a species that your average person would connect with and what I forever try and remind myself is is how much in the UK your average person is disconnected from nature and it's so much more than I like to think I sometimes find myself in a cozy reassuring thought saying you know so many people feed birds in the garden so many people take up bird watching or donate to conservation organizations and your average person doesn't know a blue tit from a great tit or you know I've, I've 
read things this year. I've done some bird song videos on um, my Instagram and some people have messaged me to say they didn't even realize that different birds made different sounds. And that's made me think like, oh my gosh, people are so disconnected from our natural landscape. And that is because so much of it has been taken away from us. Um, you know, on a, a weekly or daily basis, you can go without really interacting with any kind of nature. So in terms of how the beaver reconnects people to that, I think it is a massively charismatic species, obviously. Um, like I said, it's got the innuendo on its side. <laughs> so you can always get people across with that. Um, but it is very easy to explain. It's easy to explain how um, an individual animal and its actions and the pressures it creates can influence the landscape around us. And as much as we can explain that, I also have kind of regular inner turmoil with myself is do we even need to explain it to everyone? Do we need to get every single person on the street aware of this species? Because it will benefit people, you know, bringing more nature back when I'm saying it, bringing more nature back, restoring nature, restoring habitats, restoring natural processes will benefit people without them even realizing. And I think people have felt that more without even really knowing what they're feeling during this good old 2020, when the importance of local green space and fresh air and nice places to walk, and get outside has become just so kind of poignant. So I think, yes, we need to tell people about it. Yes, it's a great species in order to say, hey, look, this is nature thing. It's amazing. Take a look at this beaver. But also people won't even need to know and it'll still benefit them, if that makes sense. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> You're here to talk and tell us. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it, it's something that I think a lot about because, um, you know, I, I consider that a very big part of what I do is trying to reach new audiences and particularly making what I am passionate about more inclusive, um, you know, whether that's race, whether that's, you know, class, whether, you know, and especially blur blurring this line between the kind of the rural and the urban. And um, Derek, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, the potential for, um, you know, how does sort of beaver reintroductions in more urban environments where there's suitable habitat, um, you know, the, the otter sprints in right in Birmingham city centre. So is there any potential for this to to extend beyond the kind of a rural interest story, if you like, into kind of something that actually takes this story to a whole new audience in inverted commas? Of course we can do this. There's no earthly reason why they shouldn't be living on the Thames. There's no earthly reason why they shouldn't be in the Lee on urban rivers with people delighting in their presence. And there, though, there may be a few infrastructural issues. And yeah, every and, and although every so often one of them's going to bore away straight, bore its roots straight through somebody's garden gate and go in and eat their carrots or gardenias, you're going to have an awful lot of people who just delight in the idea of, of wild nature being there. They are not a species of wilderness. They live right in the middle of, of Munich and Salzburg and Vienna. And in the main, the response from the people that live there to the beavers has been one of overwhelming joy. But the big problem with this actually now, it has to be said, is no longer the landowners and farmers. There are very many of them who, who see and who know that change is coming and who welcome it positively with open arms. The problem is our own inertia. You know, we've been used to, to a time where, you know, we talk about doing things. As nature conservationists in Britain, we, we, we've strode the world studying small things, mollusks and, and bacteria that live in the gut and the, the back end of things, bums. But at the end of it all, when it comes to restoring nature fast, we've been good at talking a big story and doing very little. And that's the biggest challenge we face now. Last Friday, I sat down with Natural England to have a chat about, you know, a forward strategy for beavers. And that chat about a forward strategy, by the time we finished, it sounded more like the sort of retreat you'd see in front of the Duke of Wellington's forces um, at Waterloo. At the end of it all, we've got to start doing what people want. And what people want to see is more nature, and we should be restoring it quickly. And the urban environment where the rivers are lush and well lined by trees would for sure be a good living environment for beavers and we should be doing that um i'm not sure so you know that 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 would excite me very much in terms of as a, almost like a tool for public engagement um yet i really think you know again you know sort of stepping out of you know the familiarity of this debate it's sort of how 
you know, how do you explain, um, I mean, maybe Anne, this is a question for you, um, to someone who is not familiar with all of this debate, so I just banged my table, everyone, sorry about that. Um, how do you explain this sort of the depth of feeling and the controversy and the conflicts, you know, um, how would you explain that to someone who is completely new to this debate and to all these concepts? Yeah, thank you. I was, um, funny enough, I've been following the questions and somebody has asked, I don't understand where the conflict and controversy comes from. And the difficulty is, it's something that's actually um, been created by ourselves and it's actually the language that we've been using and some of the rhetoric has been quite dangerous and, it, and, it, and it's wrong and we've um, been pushing far too hard to get a decision made now because we somehow feel that we're in a rush and we're not because we shouldn't be I know Derek is shaking his head um, <laughs> <laughs> but we can't we can't rush this decision because we will regret it later if we do not have the plans in place, a robust management plan that is scrutinized, that is looked over again and again and reviewed. If we do not have the funding in place in order to do the small bits of infrastructure that Derek was just suggesting that will have to happen if they go into urban areas, we can't do it because somebody has to be responsible for these animals being in the landscape. And yeah, I, I absolutely, I, I have this challenge in, in the role in the CLA that we are representing a diverse membership and we have members who have trials and enclosed trials on their land and fully supportive of it and they have been assessed and then they're in the appropriate landscapes. I also have members who do not want to see them on their land and we have to respect the landowners and the farmers who are still trying to do their role in land management, but in a different way. And I think we have to remember that there is more to the British countryside than just the beaver. So I think it, it's a challenge. And I think we have to have more positive engagement. And Derek and I have known each other a long time through doing this work. And we all have an element of trust. And what we did on the River Otter was brilliant because the people that we got in a room together you just wouldn't have imagined was possible. And, um, and it was a really successful uh, representation of what can happen when you do work together on this. And as Derek said mm. earlier, we have to find a way to move forward yeah. because they are in the landscape now. So, mm. but we shouldn't rush to make any big decisions yet. We're not ready. Derek. <laughs> if we wait long enough, the only thing that's certain in life is we will die. And when you say, you know, we talk about the 20 quarter century, I've worked with this animal immediately before my lifetime. The Forestry Commission, Bill Grant, Jack Charb, John Covey, very nearly um, pulled off a restoration in Grisdale Forest, which was thwarted by the then Nature Conservancy Council for no reason at all. You just had a lot of wee pen pushers that wanted to get something complicated off their desk and they turned around and said no. If you wait, you will die. Bear that in mind. We should move on quickly. We're looking at an extinction crisis here. And a res to say our response to the crisis is weak and inadequate would, would, would be no underestimation of where we are. But Anne is right. She's right in that we have to have a competent system of beaver management in place. And we have to have the ability to deliver that. But we can. There are huge sums of money, 3.3 billion, have been spent under the common agricultural policy, in large part to give us farmers a thing called single farm payment. The single farm payment we get for doing, you know, nothing. We don't have to make a hedge a bit higher. We don't have to dig another pond. We don't have to reseed wildflowers. We just own the land and we get it for sitting here on our butts. If you look at what it costs to manage beavers effectively in Bavaria, a country that is approximately the same size as Scotland, it costs something like one and a half million annually. And part of that budget includes land purchase, so that for awkward corners where the beavers are always going to be, and the only solution is to return it to wetland, you can buy them and then when you own it, that's it. There's no problem with what it is. But that, that 1.5 million, which everybody looks at and says, that's a lot of money. That's the average uh, single farm payment income for about 20 farms in Tayside. The money's there, it just depends what we're going to spend the money on. But, but to come back to the competence part of it, 
this is one of the big problems. At the end of it all is that are, the beavers are a well understood animal. We're going to learn nothing new about it in this country other than how, it, how, how, how tasty it finds cricket back willow and how able it's going to be to adapt arboreta that are 150 years old back into a swamp. And those are how things are going to happen because of course we have these cultural peccadilloes with certain kinds of trees. But, but when it comes to it, the management of this animal is well understood in North America. It's well understood in Europe. All we need to do is pick up a European blueprint and apply it here and apply it competently. And that's the biggest worry now, is that, you know, now at the, the, the gates of a new dawn, when, when a consensus has really formed that we should be doing this and we should be moving on um, quite swiftly, as opposed to slowly with this species, is that we just actually can't get our act together to pick up and read a blueprint or translate it. And what we do is we create imaginary issues, we, we invent new evidence gaps simply because it's our job to do it, and, and, and we've got to find missing evidence just to justify our own existence. And we put obstacles in the way that are simply not real. And that's the problem. The problem is competence and actually sorting out a system that works. And if we can do those two things, we can move on swiftly, and it's what we absolutely must do. Eric is, um, I mean, he, he's a very persuasive person and, uh, and we probably, I imagine, preaching to the converted on here and absolutely right in, in some of what he is saying. But we've got to remember the people that don't, are unaware and are not in the beaver bubble, as it was said earlier, and who don't understand this. And also the, the farmers and landowners who don't understand all of the arguments or do not feel that their grade one arable land is actually going to be appropriate to see a beaver run down the watercourse. And we've just got to be so careful with this language that's used. And I think actually it's probably to DEFRA and the, and the government to actually help with the communication of this as well. It's not just what the CLA or the NFU say or, or other groups, the Beaver Trust, it's actually, you know, DEFRA has to communicate this too. And that's why we have to, again, I'll repeat it, go back to having a robust management plan in place before we even consider allowing beavers to spread more widely in the landscape. So it's, it's interesting listening to this, um, you know, as, as, the, as the moderator, because it's, um, it feels like it, it's sort of signaling something about our cur the current state of our relationship with the natural world. And while we are focused on one species because this particular species has, um, you know, as a keystone species or more than that, even as Derek says, um, from an ecological point of view, has the capacity to impact more than, you know, the sum of its parts. So what I'm interested in, in maybe Lucy at, at this point, um, is how, you know, listening to this debate, listening to actually the fact that, you know, we must remember that a lot has been achieved because there's been collaboration, even when people don't necessarily see eye to eye on every count. Um, what does this tell us about the potential to move forward from where we are? And I just wonder what Lucy, what you have to, you know, what, what this, um, what you have to say to that. Oh, the potential to move forward. Um... I mean, I totally get both sides. And I think somebody summed it up in the comments there really well saying, you know, we can put good robust plans in place and a framework and a management plan. And we can do that with urgency and at speed. You know, the two things are not not conducive to each other. We can do it together. And um, there is definitely urgency. Um, I know beavers are just one species that we're talking about here. But in terms of wide scale restoration of nature, we've had the headlines today that we've lost over, I think it's over two thirds of vertebrate animals. <laughs> like in, in terms of mass in the world, which is, to me is just terrifying. It's, it's blindly terrifying. Um, and I get that there's, there's obviously, um, conflict is a word that's used quite a lot, but there's concerns from different parties that are involved in you know, land management and the debate. But the thing that I always think about wider conservation issues is that nobody bringing stuff to the table generally has bad intentions. People are all doing things for in their mind, positive reasons. People want positive outcomes. And we are all humans. And like you said, we can just work together, bring in all the stakeholders that we want to, to talk about this um, and hopefully address some of those. I'm just reading the comments in here as well. Um, address some of those issues that you're talking about. Um, 
but yeah, going forward, I don't know. I think the summary of just saying, yeah, plan it, but with urgency is the best thing. Okay, Derek. And we are going forward because when I began to work with beavers, and I mean, I, I'd also like to say at this point in time, I mean, you, you said about more to do with them than anybody else. That's actually not true. When you look at my European counterparts, remarkable people like Gerhard Schwab, who through his massive imagination, dedication and ability has saved over a thousand animals from Bavaria, transported them to East and restored this species in abundance to countries like Croatia, Serbia, Belgium. Um, you know, you're looking at a man who, is, who, who has achieved so much. All I'm doing is copying um, a, 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 a format that's already been laid down. But we have to act now. There's, there's simply no time to, to delay. And I think one of the things I'd also like to say is that, you know, times are changing. You know, that old policies of confrontation, well, you see them get, you know, rear their ugly heads every so often. And yes, they're still there in, in the arguments of the grouse moors and in, in the north, the intensive farming systems, which do so much damage. But as Lucy just pointed out, 95% of this planet now, the, the vertebrate biomass, 95% of it on this planet is humans or the domestic animals. And we hear people talk about a balance with nature. There's no balance with nature anymore. What we're looking at, you know, even in the elephants that fill our screens on a Sunday night are the last tiny tendrils of other life on this planet. And it's ancient other life that's older than us, just blowing away in our own lifetimes. And, and if there isn't, if that doesn't put some sort of burden of inherent responsibility on us as individuals to, to at least try to do better, how are we ever going to explain our inactivity and our lack of enthusiasm and haste to the generations that are going to follow? Sure, we're switching ourselves off from reality. You know, my own kid, you know, if he was here tonight, we'd be probably playing some violent computer game where he, he mugs, I don't know, aliens using a chain and a, a pair of bicycle clips. But at the end of it all, it's a terrifying future for us as a species as we shut ourselves increasingly off from reality of what this world is. You know, we're not we're not just damaging the prospects for its further existence. We're damaging the prospects of our own existence. We can't exist without reality, and reality, in large part, is nature. We're part of nature. We're not divorced from it. And COVID has showed us this fairly graphically. So when it comes to the return of the beaver, it's been an encouraging thing. When I started, there were none of them, not a single Eurasian beaver in a zoo in Britain. And now, okay, it's a small number, maybe a thousand, thousand plus animals living wild in Britain, but it's gone right to the top of the political agenda as an issue. And organizations which had never considered it before, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, are at least in England, in large part, sitting down candidly, sometimes warmly, but in the main sanely to discuss where we go from there. And that is progress. Maybe not as fast as it should be. And no, I do not agree with further delay. And it's certainly not going to be part of my agenda to incur any more of that. But we are looking at a good building base, at least to start from. Excellent. There is a lot of chat and comments. Um, I think this would be a really good time to, um, I know Sophie's been keeping an eye on the Q&A box and, and hopefully picking out a few of the questions to put to the panel. Um, Sophie? Hello again. Um, thank you, Gillian. I mean, goodness me, I am struggling to keep up with everything here because there are just, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, clearly. However, we have got just over 10 minutes left until uh, the end of the um, panel event. So I have got some questions that I'd like to ask each of you. So we've got one from Sally LePage and this one I'm gonna put to Derek. She says, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. It's good, but <laughs> why, why is this so controversial? Why has it taken so long to get to this point with beavers? And I'm going to extend it and broaden it out and say, why are we even having to have these debates and conversations, given the fact that we're in an ecological crisis and the hydrological benefits and benefits and services to us as people? Why, why is it taking so long? I mean, you mentioned that there's been progress and there definitely has been marked progress, but 
why are we having to have these conversations in the first place when to science it seems fairly obvious that it should have been done ages ago? Well, in the beginning, it was a fight. You had a very simple, I guess, you know, conflict with nature conservationists saying one thing and the other land use organisations, the commercial forestry boys, farming organisations, you know, organisations like the NFU now, with whom, by and large, we have a relatively cordial relationship, all saying no. The politicians played on that. The nature conservation authorities, the SNCOs, who are weak, didn't know what to do. And it was just a football. And, and you know, I've worked on, you know, many proposals at a time when there were no beavers anywhere else and the amount of behind the scenes politicking there was that brought project after project down could have left one feeling incredibly bitter. But the reality was, as I was telling somebody yesterday, is that every time when things seemed at their darkest and it looked as if no progress at all could be made, all of a sudden there'd be a light burning again in the dark. And it went on and on to the point where SNH or Scottish, the uh, SNP decided in Scotland that they would move on with beavers and Napdale, and that was a step forward. It achieved, you know, it was 12 years of debate to get there, but they said yes. And then the most remarkable thing that ever happened was the wild ones occurred. And the wild ones, the ones that people frankly just released, took us forward by a lifetime to a point where we're having to have grown up conversations about what we're going to do with these animals. And it's no longer nebulous and it's no longer down to, to windy academics with tiny shrill voices coming up with silly ideas, you know, in rooms to please their fellows. There's a reality here now. So it's, it's, it's been an incredible journey and it continues to be that. I agree with you. This is an easy thing to do. If we were talking about the return of the wolf, then we'd be looking at something that's slightly more challenging. Again, perfectly doable from a, a biological point of view, but from a cultural point of view, I mean, I'm looking at Anne and she's smiling at me, but inside you know she's not smiling at all. Um, but at the end, <laughs> well, she, she's laughing now. Um, but, um, but at the end of it all, you know, you can see something that would have substance as an argument. Whereas the beaver is it's just so benign that, it, that it's barely worth bothering about. The only issue with them is they will take land. But it's land that we don't need for farming in many parts of the UK, and which would be much better suited to holding water anyway and slowing the flow and producing a much, much larger civic good um, than it currently does, you know, when it keeps, you know, a few sheep with their fairly worthless lambs, you know, on rainy days. Thank you. And um, straight on to the next question, I'm going to put this one to Gillian. Um, this is from Steve Pike, and he says, trying to distinguish between human needs and nature's needs is half of why we're in a crisis. Our needs are surely those of nature. What do you think? Well, um, I would agree with that, but I'm aware not everyone sees it that way and I guess for me you know that's the challenge always is um is trying to understand why people don't see that or why I see it that you know it's sort of trying to jump tracks and see things from a different perspective certainly um my what you know my experience from you know having the privilege to be reporting about beavers um from virtually a standing start a few years ago to being able to share you know my experience of being um very immersed in the project at Cornwall Beaver Project and seeing those changes firsthand over a very short amount of time um what was always underlying that um experience and all the conversation around that was the benefits it had to the communities downstream from that and particularly in that particular project, you know, the issues around flooding and um, managing the flow of the river there uh, was really, really important. And it seemed to me that actually in that instance, the needs of both the people, the communities there and the, and the environment were met in one, with one solution. And so that is what I found really compelling about that. And I think, you know, I think Anne is right that communication, word choice, 
is really, really important in, in how we, um, how we com communicate that more. And I would add to that as well, maybe just because of, you know, the perspective I come from is, is, you know, moving it out of this, you know, very kind of polarized sometimes, you know, um, debate around land use and farming, obviously that's huge, but um, there is so much potential in re-engaging people, reconnecting people um, in urban areas and suburban even, um, you know, to provide that experience that I had in that very short amount of time in a tiny little enclosure, which was to feel like I was in a genuinely wild, wild space, was um, honestly, you know, it, it really has made me kind of hopeful again, as someone who works and communicates mm. in the space of ecology and conservation and environmentalism. Um, I really believe that, you know, when, when you find that sweet spot where um, people's needs and nature's needs are kind of aligned and everything, then they're met by the same solutions, then, you know, I hate to use the analogy, but the floodgates open, you know, and, um, and, you know, there's an alignment there, then it feels like you're not pulling and tugging against each other. Thank you. And um, this one I'm going to put to mainly Anne, but whoever would like to has an answer really. So this is from Chris Farmer. Um, and he says, being an ecologist, I'm all for beaver ecosystem en engineer introduction across the country. But if widespread and not in enclosures, how are we going to win over intensive farmers and anglers who see them maybe as impacting on their interests and end up like Scotland, which uh, had approved releases on the one hand and then within a few months are issuing licenses to control them? Is that a communication story or is that something else? It's a bit of both. Um, so I think the Scottish story is different and it's something where certainly when you know we've been looking at uh, the management strategy for the river otter we've used that as a, a lesson learned um, in how the farmers were um, managed and how the populations were managed up there and obviously the difference with Scotland is they have protective status up there so that's why the licenses have come in as they have in order to start to manage them and control them. I think down here in England, if this moves forward, aren't necessarily, as, as I've seen in the comments here as well, landowners aren't all necessarily absolutely against beavers. In fact, people can see the clear benefits of them. However, in certain areas, it really won't work on um, prime agricultural land. We wouldn't want to see them there. And I've been in such that they are terrible land. What those farmers see going to have, they want to be productive management and support financially and resource if beavers are on land that it's inappropriate. Um, so I would say it's not a case of having to persuade everybody, it's actually just making sure that beavers are in the appropriate landscapes and if necessary, necessarily removed, if, if found to be where they, where they really shouldn't be and could cause an issue. Can I say a couple of things about that? First and foremost, Will Bond from the CLA has posted a couple of comments and Will, if you keep on doing that, we're gonna put super glue in your boots on the 28th when we start putting dynamite in those trees and that'll be the end of you, okay? Bear that in mind. The next thing is, <laughs> Um, when it comes to the beavers on the arable landscapes, there is a big problem with an animal that can basically put dams in ditches and slow the flow of flatlands where essential falls and drainage are tiny. There are big problems with an animal that can burrow into flood walls and open those flood walls in the night to let vast amounts of water into the crops beyond. So in the first instance, putting them into intensive arable landscapes is really not a good idea. If you want to have, you know, you create the eye of the storm instantly, that's what you do. And unfortunately, with regard to the beaver escapes on the Tay, that's exactly what happened. They went into an arable landscape, which was intensively used, and then you have this fight. 
I do not agree with the killing there. I think it's completely wrong. It's politically motivated. It's stupid. It's showing the other land use industries quite wrongly in a very poor light, especially with the killing that's illegal and the killing that's using the wrong kind of firearms. The photographs that were up last week of that beaver that was shot in the face, well, I've seen the photographs of the x-rays and most of those pellets bounced right off its head and it did not die fast. So that's wrong. And that has to change. There are very few beavers in Britain. Um, they're a valuable resource. We must be catching them and translocating them and putting them in landscapes where the tree corridors are well developed, like the river at the bottom of my farm, and, and, and where the landscape's in size and where you're really, there is virtually no conflict at all. And the final thing I'll say with regard to angling is just this. Angling. The people that constantly come up with objections based on no science and no evidence and really, you know, nothing at all, um, are focused on one fish, on the Atlantic salmon. There is no evidence that, game fit, that the Atlantic salmon is, is, is adversely affected by beaver activity and what evidence there is from countries like Norway demonstrates quite graphically that it is not. But even if it was, think it through. It means that all the other things this animal does in environments, all the other biodiversity benefits it brings, the water purification benefits, the sustainability of creating landscapes that are resilient against flooding, is if you're really serious about what you're proposing is no beavers at all, it means that nothing else can live. And the communities downstream that are suffering these, these effects who could be, you know, delivered a system of sustainable alleviation, well, you don't care about them because one day you want to stand on the bank of a river with a big fish in your hands and send a photograph home to your mum. There's no a, a, a scintillance of sense in it. And frankly, unless, you know, some sort of scientific thread emerges which backs up the accusations, it should just be ignored. It's nonsense and it's wrong. So I have no sympathy in any large part for that point of view, unless it produces evidence, an evidence base that's not just folk belief um, that suggests there is an issue at all, because at this point in time, there isn't. Okay, thank you very much. Now, we are slightly over time. However, Lucy, I just want to ask you a very quick question. How important is education in this whole conversation? Because presumably, you know, we are, there are generations behind us now who are going to be taking on all of these challenges. How can we prepare them to take this baton and try and make good decisions? Oh, crikey, yeah, I've got to answer that quickly. Um, I think it starts at both ends. So like we've already covered, we have a massive disconnect um, publicly in our society from nature. Um, kids don't learn about it at school. And we're hopefully taking some good steps in the right direction. So there's going to be the Natural History GCSE, which geeky 15 year old me would have loved to have had when I was a teenager. Um, so hopefully we can start educating people about ecology, natural history, ecological processes from a younger age. And it just becomes woven into ways of thinking, ways of working. And also amazing um, projects and trials like the River Otter Beaver Trial. Um, the evidence that that gathers, the, the data, the scientific uh, all reports that we've got from that, all of the measurements, all of the experiments that we've done, that feeds into that much more advanced level of education. So it's backing up, just as Derek said, everything has, um, you know, backed up evidence. This is why this happens. This is why that assertion isn't true. This is why this assertion is true. And then we've educated at both ends. Does that answer it? Sorry, I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> no, no, don't worry about that at all. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just going to start summarising now and start wrapping up, but I think from what we've spoken about and as I'm sure you realise everyone at home that there is a lot to talk about here, but I think we can sort of hopefully agree on the fact that it's all about creating space for nature, it's about giving rivers the space to flow naturally with enough of a buffer to remove these problems and to be a mitigating force against the second biggest rodent in the world. Um, and along with good management, communication and education, we have real hope that, you know, we won't be having to have these discussions and debates in 10 years time. It will just become normal. Um, and I do just want to repeat something that Derek said that I wrote down or scribbled down very roughly that I loved. And he said that collaboration has to be increasingly confident and swift. 
and it works and how we reshape the tapestry of this island, create a better living landscape for people and a better living landscape for beavers. Uh, for us, no, sorry, a better living landscape for people, a better living landscape for nature and beavers can help us do that. And I think with that, I'm going to have to sadly end the panel discussion. However, I can't thank our panelists enough, uh, Lucy, Derek, Anne and Gillian. Gillian, thank you for being an amazing chair. This has been a complicated discussion to field because everyone's got different opinions and things to say. Um, thank you so much for Chelsea Green Publishing for making this happen and for my colleagues at Beaver Trust for supporting this conversation as well. Um, the event, if you want to watch it again or if you want to share it on social media, can be found on the Chelsea Green YouTube channel very shortly and we will be sending everybody who, have, who has registered and participated in this live event, we'll be sending you the link very shortly as well, just in case you've missed it or want to share it around too. Once again, you can buy Derek's fantastic book, Bringing Back the Beaver. <laughs> Just to plug again at anywhere that sells books, Gillian's holding up. You can't miss the giant beaver on the front. Um, again, try and support your local indie bookstore if you can. Um, and also, this is the first um, sort of webinar that Beaver Trust um, and Chelsea Green has been involved in together, co-hosted. Um, there seems to be a lot uh, that people want to say. So we are thinking of hosting more webinars like this. So if you would like to see more conversations in this same format um, that are for free and you can register just as you have done this evening please let us know um, you can contact beaver trust and chelsea green on social media um, and we will try and make it happen but we want to try and um, keep talking and keep having these conversations and being very open and sort of pragmatic about this sort of stuff so um, we'd appreciate your feedback um, and yes, thank you very much, everybody. And we're going to let you crack on with your evening. And um, yes, hopefully see you soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.